Wall Street. Most of us know what happened here 50 years ago. Inside the stock exchange, on October 29, 1929, the market collapsed. It came to be known as Black Thursday. The Wall Street crash was followed by the worst depression in American history. That depression has been blamed on the failure of capitalism. It was no such thing, but the myth lives on. What really happened was very different. Although things looked healthy on the surface, business had begun to turn down in mid-1929. The crash intensified the recession. So did continuing bank failures in the South and Midwest. But the recession only became a crisis when these failures spread to New York. And in particular, to this building, then the headquarters of the Bank of United States. The failure of this bank had far-reaching effects, and it need never have happened. It was something of a historical accident that this particular bank played the role it did. Why did it fail? It was a perfectly good bank. Banks that were in far worse financial shape had come under difficulties before it did, and had, through the cooperation of other banks, been saved. The reason why it wasn't saved has to do with its rather special character. First, its name, Bank of United States, a name that made immigrants believe it was an official governmental bank, although, in fact, it was an ordinary commercial bank. Second, its ownership, Jewish. Both its name and the character of its ownership which had so much to do with attracting a large number of depositors from the many Jewish businessmen in the city of New York. Both of them also had the effect of alienating other bankers who did not like the special advantage of the name and did not like the character of the ownership. As a result, other banks were all too ready to spread rumors, to help promote an atmosphere in which runs got started on the bank, in which it came into difficulty. And they were less than usually willing to cooperate in the efforts that were made to save it. Only a few blocks away is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It was here that the Bank of the United States could have been saved. Indeed, the Federal Reserve System had been set up 17 years earlier, precisely to prevent the worst consequences of bank failures. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York, whose directors today meet in this room, devised a plan in cooperation with the superintendent of banking of the state of New York to save the Bank of the United States. Their plan called for merging the Bank of the United States with several other banks, and also providing a guarantee fund to be subscribed to by still other bankers uh, to assure the depositors that the assets of the Bank of the United States were safe and sound. The Reserve Bank called meeting after meeting to try to put the plan into effect. It was on again, off again. But finally, after an all-night meeting on December 10th, 1930, the other bankers, including in particular John Pierpont Morgan, refused to subscribe to the guarantee fund, and the plan was off. The next day, the Bank of the United States closed its doors, never again to open for business. For its depositors, who saw their savings tied up and their businesses destroyed, the closing was tragic. Yet when the bank was finally liquidated, in the worst years of the Depression, it paid back 92 and a half cents on the dollar. Had the other banks cooperated to save it, no one would have lost a penny. For the other New York banks, they thought that closing the Bank of the United States would have purely local effects. They were wrong partly because it had so many depositors, partly because so many of the depositors were small businessmen, partly because it was the largest bank that had ever been permitted to fail in the United States up to this time. The effects were far-reaching. Depositors all over the country were frightened about the safety of their funds and rushed to withdraw them. There were runs, there were failures of banks by the droves, and all the time the Federal Reserve System stood idly by when it had the power and the duty and the responsibility to provide the cash 
that would have enabled the banks to meet the insistent demands of their depositors without closing their doors. The way runs on banks can spread and can be stopped is a consequence of the way our banking system works. <laughs> you may think that when you take some cash to a bank and deposit it, the bank takes that money and sticks it in a vault somewhere to wait until you need it again to turn it back over to you. Okay, how would you like this? Like two tens, one five, and five ones. Okay. The bank does no such thing. It immediately takes a large part of what you put in and lends it out to somebody else. How do you suppose it earns interest to pay its expenses or to pay you something for the use of your money? The result is that if all depositors at all the banks tried all at once to convert their deposits into cash, there wouldn't be anything like enough cash in the banks of the country to meet their demands. In order to prevent such an outcome, in order to cut short a run, it's necessary to have some way either to stop people from asking for it or to have some additional source from which cash can be obtained. That was intended to be the purpose of the Federal Reserve System. It was to provide the additional cash to meet the demands of depositors when a run arose. Why didn't this system prevent the Great Depression after 1929? Because from 1929 to 1930, after the stock market crash, the Federal Reserve System allowed the quantity of money to decline slowly, thereby throttling the monetary structure. By December 1930, the quantity of money had fallen by 3%, which may not seem much, but a growing economy needs additional money in order to prevent deflation and problems. Given this throttling of the monetary system, what happened after that was more or less inevitable. If the Bank of the United States had not happened to fail, some other bank would have been the victim. It would have failed and would have set off the runs. Once the runs started, the Federal Reserve could have prevented them from having the disastrous consequences they did by stepping in and providing the banking system in general through creating new money with the cash it needed to meet the demands of depositors. After all, once depositors start trying to take their money out of the banks, there is a strong tendency for the quantity of money to fall. Each dollar of cash which is withdrawn from a bank had been backing several dollars of deposits. If the Federal Reserve had stepped in, bought government securities on a large scale, provided the cash, the depositors would have found that they could get their money and they would have stopped asking for it. The end result was that by the time the whole sorry episode was over, by 1933, the quantity of money in the United States had gone down by a third. The slow throttling had turned into strangulation. For every $3 of currency and deposits that people had had in 1929, only $2 were left. For every three banks that were open in 1929, in 1933, only two were left. The terrible depression that followed was a direct result of bungling by the Federal Reserve System. Their monetary policy stifled any hope of economic recovery. Although these events happened almost 50 years ago, many of our policies today derive directly from them. Central bankers throughout the world, government officials everywhere, are afraid of a new Great Depression. They have therefore moved in the opposite direction. Instead of the problem of too little money, we are faced with the problem of too much money. The problems of inflation that plague us today trace directly from the problem of deflation that plagued us from 1929 to 1933. People came to believe that free market capitalism had failed. Something was needed to replace it. At Cambridge University in England, a new orthodoxy emerged in the 30s, one that has remained powerful to this day. It owes its influence to the brilliance of one man. John Maynard Keynes was unquestionably one of the greatest economists of all time. 
Like other economists of his generation, he found the Great Depression both a paradox and a challenge. It was a paradox because it seemed to contradict some of the fundamental principles that economists had come to take for granted. Keynes rose to the challenge by constructing a complex and sophisticated hypothesis which not only explained what had been going on, but also offered a way out a way to end the Great Depression and to avoid similar episodes in the future. The core of his theory was that what happened to the quantity of money didn't matter. What really mattered was a particular category of spending, in economists' jargon, autonomous spending. What kind of spending is that? It might be investment by business enterprises in building factories and adding to the number of machines and adding to inventories. It might be spending by individuals to build houses. Or, most important of all, it might be deficit spending by government. If private spending on investment, on house building, was not enough to maintain full employment, then government could always step in and spend enough to make up the difference. The theory of pump priming was born. The theory was a godsend to politicians that had been, who had been grasping at any expedient. After all, throughout the ages, politicians have been only too willing to spend money, provided they didn't have to tax their citizens to pay for it. And here along came a scientific theory offered under the most responsible of auspices that justified what they had been wanting to do all along. Is it any wonder that government spending has exploded ever since? Or that deficit spending, even without the excuse of war, and on a large scale, has become the order of the day? In America, the new Roosevelt administration adopted the Keynesian approach. It authorized massive spending on government projects. It involved government increasingly in the running of the economy. It developed programs designed to provide security for every individual. The massive growth of central government that started after the Depression has continued ever since. If anything, it has even speeded up in recent years. Each year, there are more buildings in Washington occupied by more bureaucrats administering more laws. The Great Depression persuaded the public that private enterprise was a fundamentally unstable system, that the Depression represented a failure of free market capitalism, that the government had to step in to perform the essential function of stabilizing the economy, of providing security for its citizens. The widespread acceptance of these views sparked the enormous growth in the power of government that has occurred in the decades since and that is still going on. We now know, as many economists knew then, that the truth about the Depression was very different. The Depression was produced, or at the very least, made far worse by perverse monetary policies followed by the U.S. authorities. Far from being a failure of free market capitalism, the Depression was a failure of government. Unfortunately, that failure did not end with the Great Depression. Ever since, government has been attempting to fine-tune the economy. In practice, just as during the Depression, far from promoting stability, the government has itself been the major single source of instability. 